A uh, special operations executive was set up by Churchill at a time that was very, very difficult for the Allies. Um, Europe was entirely Nazi occupied. And there was a sense of frustration that, you know, we had uh, a, a large willing army which had left Europe from Dunkirk uh, and couldn't find a way of engaging with the war, with the, with the enemy. Uh, and so uh, it was decided that one thing that the British could at least do was sabotage and go into Nazi-occupied Europe and, um, uh, as, as Winston Churchill said, set Europe ablaze. So that was the idea that people would go in, um, set off bombs, blow up trains, blow up factories uh, and so on, and at least make life difficult for the, the Nazis, even if we couldn't actually confront them on the battlefield. Everyone has come across Odette, I think, um, largely because of the film, which was, um, I remember watching one Sunday afternoon um, in the 60s, probably, um, black and white, uh, and also Carve Her Name with Pride, the Violet Zabo film with Virginia McKenna. Uh, these are, you know, intensely moving and, and thrilling stories. And of course, they, they are so much more, the more so, because the main character is female. The background of, of women agents uh, was incredibly varied. Uh, some of them were quite well educated, um, but the, the, the crucial thing for them uh, was the ability to speak the language. Uh, and a lot of them, as a consequence, were not really well suited to this kind of work. They just happened to speak French or Swedish or whatever the language was that was, was necessary. How would you like to go to France? Go to France? Why, how can people go to France now? There are ways and means, you know. You mean to tell me that people are being sent to France by the war office? By the war office? Good heavens, no. They're a respectable institution. They wouldn't do things like that. Now, let me explain. You're a Frenchwoman. You were born in France and lived there until you married and came to England. We need the help of people like you. But I must warn you, if you do decide to join us, your work will be highly dangerous. But, but I do not think that I am qualified to do dangerous work. The training these people then received was um, has a slightly comic aspect. Um, there would be a psychological test which would take place in London and a lot of be shown cards, sort of ink blot tests, what does this suggest to you? A lot of really quite rudimentary stuff. Uh, and then uh, they would have a chat with a psychologist who would try to determine, and quite often the psychologist would say to Buckmaster Vera Atkins, I don't think this this woman is right and Buckmaster would say well she speaks French so she's going uh, and they would then go to um, a country house um, probably in Hampshire, Bewley or Warnborough in Sussex and there would be a group of them and they were then rigorously physically trained um, and shown how to use a Sten gun uh, with physical jerks and then they'd be they'd have mock interrogations so they they would be called out of their bed at two o'clock in the morning, hauled downstairs by two angry men who would put their faces close to them and shout at them. You know, what is your name? Where do you live? What was your address? You see a very watered down version of this in Odette when Buckmaster, actually it's not Buckmaster, it's the guy who plays M in the James Bond film, uh, asks her a few difficult questions and she answers, she gets the addresses right. So well, that seems absolutely fine. It was a lot more frightening than that in real life. And they were made, they were reduced to tears, they were bullied. This was but well, they had to be, this was, you know, to prepare them. Uh, and if they got through all that okay, and there'd be map reading and they'd be shown all sorts of very James Bond-like uh, little bits of kits they could use, like uh, a, a mouse with a grenade in it, a sort of a, a, a toy rat, which they could detonate and all sorts of slightly absurd things like this, but also how to use plastic explosive, which was, you know, seriously useful. And sometimes there's, where well, was one agent in the field who was so hungry um, because he couldn't get any food in France, that he ate some of the plastic explosive, which he found actually quite sustaining, I believe. <laughs> Women uh, in SOE in France tended to start as couriers, which meant that they simply ran messages. So characteristically, uh, a man of some experience, you would hope, uh, in this kind of work, would be dropped somewhere near Poitiers or Reims or Paris or Bordeaux, wherever it was, to set up a network and so you'd have a, a circuit leader and a radio operator and no, then you would through. probably After have a courier, weeks, someone who could run messages, messages between your network and the next one because obviously communicating by telephone was, was not really on. Three weeks and not they got their message. Don't swear, Arno, there's a lady in the next room. Pretty? 
Not bad. Come on, let's have these messages. Oh. oh. This is Arno, and this is Lise. She's just arrived in the field. But many women went on to do much more than simply courier work, and we see in the film Odette at one point saying, um, Peter's not the circuit leader, I am the circuit leader, I'm in charge. And indeed she was very you know, active and busy. And later on in the war, uh, there, were, there was a woman called Pearl Witherington, an English woman who'd gone out uh, to France, and she ended up r in charge of 1,500 men f uh, of French resistance fighting the Germans after D-Day, um, you know, taking on full um, German military battalions. Uh, that was quite unusual, but basically, although women went out initially as uh, as couriers, some as wireless operators, they could, according to the circumstances, and the circumstances were extraordinary and developing rapidly every day, they could do anything. Peter would be flattered to hear you say that. He was not the head of the circuit. I was. It was I who persuaded him to come to France. What he did here, and it was very little, he did under my influence. The motivation of these people is, I think that everyone had a different reason. I think some of them genuinely hated the Nazis. Um, I think some of them found they were drawn in deeper than they had expected. I mean, when they answered the, the advertisements, which were, I mean, for instance, the advertisements that Odette answers is for pictures of the north coast of France. And I don't suppose she knew at the moment that she was answering that she was going to be risking her life and that she was going to be tortured in a, um, some sort of horrific Nazi camp. Uh, so I think it was a sort of step by step thing, though I do think um, SOE were, were reasonable about explaining the um, the risks to them. Now, this is your lethal tablet. In case you get into a jam and you can't get out. Swallow that and... You think of everything, mon commandant. We have to. The way in which these women were prepared to go off and, you know, that they would have thought their chances of return were not much better than 50-50 and leaving small children behind, that's uh, an extraordinary aspect of it, really. This is Odette. Oh, thank you, I am very well. Reverend Mother, I have to go to Scotland. If I am not here for the holidays, my aunt will arrange for the children to go somewhere safe. Ye yes, I do not want them to be in London. It is too dangerous. And, you know, the bits yeah, that really no, tug at your heart right. in Odette are the bits with the children. And she doesn't no. want us to have no, to no, speak no, to them at their that. convent school because it's going to stir up too much emotion. But the nun, it's too late, is already putting them on the phone. And the very good exchange with Trevor Howard when he's, and uh, he, he's talking, she's trying to get him to pass, um, to telephone, pass messages to these children, as it were, from Scotland. And he says, What's, what about the father? And she says, oh, the parents are separated. In other words, not admitting that she is the mother of these children. I want you to telephone a convent and give a message to three children there. What's the message? Will you tell them that, that their mother is very well and that she sends them her love? Say you are speaking from Scotland. How old are they? Oh, Francois is nine and two months. Lily is just turned seven. And Marianne is five. But I think also, you know, you mustn't underestimate, as far as motivation is concerned, this is simple patriotism, which is, uh, you know, something that all these years later is perhaps harder for us to understand. I think the basic idea it gives you of how how the SOE people cooperated with one another, the kind of relationship between the three of them, the Peter Ustinov character, the radio operator, Peter Churchill, the circuit head, and the courier, Odette. I think that's very realistic. The amount of travel that they did, people are always coming and going, and everyone has at least Welcome three names all cool. the time. Uh, so that, I think that gives you a very good, very accurate idea of it. Je m'appelle Lise. Je suis Georges, bonjour. Bonjour, Georges. And the danger came not just from, uh, I think at one point it was, it was thought that a typical SOE agent in France had perhaps 16 possible agencies against who might be out to get them, both French and German. So uh, German, there'd be the, 
German military, the, the Gestapo, the SS, the Sicherheitsdienst, the Abwehr, and, and likewise the, the French government, which was working with the Germans, the Vichy government, would have the milice, their own militia, as well as various kinds of secret agents, gendarmerie, police agents, and so on. So uh, anything you said, anywhere you went, you were being looked at. Uh, and so you never knew which of these 16 agencies the eyes might belong to, or they might, might belong to no one at all. Majority of French people just carried on with their lives as best they could. When I was researching the background for Charlotte Grey, it was always to, to try to keep her at as low a level as possible and to keep the James Bond stuff out of the way, to try and see what was feasible, how little somebody could do. Uh, and uh, I more or less succeeded, I think, though, it, in there's a bit more action than I'd really intended. But of course, for long, long periods, British agents in France and other countries were inactive and they became very bored and depressed and lonely. Out, you're stuck um, in a farmhouse with a radio and you only see your circuit chief about once a fortnight when he's not traveling around and you might see your courier in the other week um, and they become they became lonely and it was a very very demanding sometimes the demands were extreme danger uh, and sometimes the demands were just the resources of your own personality um, and of course this is a you know absolute gift for a novelist because the you know, somebody thrown onto their own resources. What are you made of? What, what resources do you have in, in this bizarre, these bizarre circumstances, which are a mixture of solitude and intense danger? I mean, you know, it, it will tell you a lot about the, the nature of the person, nature of humanity as well. Another poignant thing about, um, about the film of Odette is when Odette and Peter don't know if they ever, will ever see each other again and you don't know if when the guy goes off on the train ostensibly to run a simple message to a neighbouring circuit that might be the last time that you, you ever see him. And certainly love affairs during the war, well for a start uh, there was a lot more um, activity uh, because people thought well I might never see this person again there's so let, let's not stand on ceremony let's go to bed um, but secondly people who were genuinely in love it, it, it sort of added a sort of huge extra poignancy of course to the whole thing and so again for a novelist that's kind of a gift because what you have is an intensification a concentration um, and a speeding up of emotion all of which is of course very dramatic Odette, we'll meet again, won't we, after all this is over? Yes, Pierre, we shall meet somewhere. SOE was a very controversial organisation um, and it was hated by British intelligence, um, SIS, the Secret Intelligence Service, also known as MI6, which was in existence then and had its own operatives in France. And so MI6, traditionally, its um, agents are very, very highly trained. They're very bureaucratic. They follow rules and they keep an incredibly low profile. And to them, the thought that sort of playboys like Peter Churchill uh, in the film of Odette would come out and swank around, make rude remarks to the Germans about the difference between Oxford and Cambridge and blow up things was the last thing that they wanted. Their work was supposed to be secret gathering of intelligence. They didn't want amateurs blowing up trains and bridges. Roll. Do you think the Buck sent me to France to sit in cafes and to watch the girlfriends of the collaborators promenading their poodles? Of course he did. Didn't he tell you? 
But, Raoul, when am I going to begin work? My orders were to go on to Auxerre. Yes, you've, uh, you've mentioned that before. Lise, I'd like you to know that sitting here in Cannes is not my idea of fighting war any more than it's yours. Our job is to help organize French resistance. Does it matter whether we do it in Cannes, Auxerre, or Port Perro? The question of how SOE worked with the French resistance is a, is a complicated and vexed one. There, there wasn't much resistance in France in the early days of SOE. Um, because most French people thought the war would soon be over and, and so on. Uh, the French resistance didn't really begin until 1943, um, quite late, when the Germans, uh, first of all, they, they ran into the, the so-called free zone. The, the whole of France became occupied by the Germans. And secondly, they introduced something called the statutory uh, obligatory work order, the STO, which meant that all young French men um, had to go and work in German factories. And this was a massive recruiting weapon for the French resistance. So you could either go and work uh, in a um, German factory in the Ruhr Valley, or uh, you could join the res some sort of resistance, some embryonic resistance outfit, uh, or you could just disappear. So suddenly the resistance numbers began to swell. They've organized themselves. They've organized themselves beautifully. They've trained to fight like soldiers, to ambush like guerrillas, to sabotage. And they call themselves, you know what? Le Maquis. So there was communication and there was eventually cooperation, but not until quite late in the day, really after D-Day. And the group of SOE, by this time, they were developed rather different techniques, much more military and less um, hole in the corner. And after the Normandy landings in 1944, um, a large number of French resistance units began to fight vigorously and they stopped the uh, Germans reinforcing their troops in Normandy by bringing tanks and armour up from the south. And Eisenhower, who was in charge of the D-Day land landings, thought that the, the combined operations of SOE and the French resistance had been worth one extra division to him in Normandy. We know a division is a very large number of men. So at that stage, there was a, a lot of cooperation. It showed th uh, the Germans that Britain was still a player, that we could do things. It, it inconvenienced them to a large extent, to, to well, to some extent. But the, the price paid by um, the, the agents in the field was incredibly high. And the, the command in Baker Street in London was very inefficient. And I mean, tragically, uh, the biggest nas uh, network, Prosper, which was betrayed from inside by um, its French air movements officer, possibly also by British uh, competing secret intelligence service. Uh, but it was finally let down by Buckmaster himself in London when their wireless operator would have been captured. And if you'd been captured, when you sent your message to London, you, you left out the security check. That was, a, that was the absolute, you must never deviate from this then we'll know you're broadcasting under pressure of uh, in captivity. And uh, the guy, Archambault Gilbert Norman, left out his security check. And Buckmaster sent a message back saying, why have you left out your security check? Stop messing about. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, well, happily, some of them came home. Um, Nancy Wake came home. Um, Pearl Witherington came home. And these were two of the, you know, absolutely top, top people. Eileen Nairn um, came home. Uh, but um, a lot were did not come home, and they died truly horrible deaths. At the same time, Odette is in Fren prison outside Paris. Um, there are, I think, seven other women agents captured, all of whom uh, were murdered in concentration camps. This is this is the kind of end that awaited these people. And uh, Noor Inayat Khan, having escaped twice in in Paris, was eventually murdered in Dachau after hideous treatment and you know this was uh, this was about 25% of agents uh, died or female agents died this way so again you have to ask you know how much did they achieve in their missions that, that made this worthwhile stories which are you have to regard with some distrust actually either because the sort of hack 
writer who was writing them wanted to make out that the subject of their biography was so glamorous and so heroic, which was the very much the taste in England uh, in terms of films and biographies in the 50s and 60s. Or because the agent themselves wanted to glamorize their own life and there's some doubt about what Odette actually did. Or because they were lying in order to protect other people. And soon after the war, the whole SOE experience and all its archive became tainted with this sort of terrible secrecy and which, you know, all British um, intelligence activities have until very recently when now MI6 has its own website and people are a little bit more open. But it was immediately grasped and locked away and no one must know and it's always not for you to know about these things, whatever happened. And this terrible institutional secrecy and duplicity, frankly, which hangs around British uh, Secret Services uh, activities. The truth about Odette, I, I certainly don't know. And certainly, even if she may have exaggerated some parts of her story or if other people exaggerated them for her, um, undoubtedly she was a very brave woman and you just, you can't, no one should ever doubt that.